Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, like you once said, let, let, let's go through two pieces of the security puzzle that way too often are missing in most organizations. Uh, the capability to detect and respond to attacks. Before we dive into this, let me introduce myself and Magnus will introduce himself. Uh, I've been working in the security industry for 15 years. I started my car career at Telia's computer emergency response team and then I proceeded to be an information security consultant in various Swedish security firms. Uh, for the last six years, I've been at the Swedish police uh, and the IT security section there. And I had the good fortune to play a key role in building the SOC and the CERT team there. Um, sorry. <laughs> Magnus? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think most of you guys can read what it says there. Uh, uh, yeah, seven years at FRA. That seems to be my pedigree. Everyone wants to know about how it is to work in the, uh, in the intelligence agency. Uh, it's absolutely super boring, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, way too many secrets uh, and too... Yeah, but it's hard. It's really hard, but, but it, it was a fun experience. Uh, so right now I'm at Circus Control working with my old uh, boss and now colleague uh, at Circus Control, Klaus. Uh, and we've been running this for close to four years, and now we are a part of the Trusek family. Yeah. I forgot to mention that my current job is uh, to drive a new business area in Trusek. We are going to offer, we are offering managed detection services. So, we are going to talk about where we are currently when it comes to detect detection and response. And we're going to um, talk about what we're doing wrong and how we can fix this. Uh, and then Magnus will show different uh, ways of detecting different types of attacks. Yeah, I'm the demo guy. The demo guy. You're the presentation <laughs> guy. I'm yeah. the demo guy. Yeah. So where are we currently? The good news is that security budgets are increasing. We have cool new security products that people are buying. Uh, we have teams who are working actively with risk management, security architecture, and so forth. Uh, but the problem is that the bad news is that we get hacked anyway. And why is that? The simple answer is that the attackers are able to run their code in our IT environment in spite of all these efforts. Another part of the problem is that incident response is still seen as a deviation, like a one-time off thing that you do, instead of seeing it as a constant and continuous work, because incident happens all the time. So, yeah, my message here is that prevention and protection are not sufficient. They are futile unless you tie them together with detection and response. Intrusions are going to happen in this interconnected world. We just have to accept it. And uh, we will, we can have the best cybersecurity programs in place, but we still can't guarantee that they will not happen. As long as we have users who are opening emails from outside world, we have users surfing web pages on the internet, and we have partners connecting to our environments, we will always be vulnerable to intrusion. But of course, obviously for business reasons, we need to be able to do these things. We need to be able to do these things from the same machine, the same endpoint that we use for accessing internal systems and handling sensitive information. Unless you're working in, in uh, the army or military where you have yeah. separate <laughs> consoles for everything and then just spread the viruses using USB sticks between them. <laughs> yeah. That's what we used to do. And as you have seen in previous attack sessions uh, done by my colleagues, um, the, the attackers also have great <laughs> built-in functions in the Windows environment that can, they can use to leverage their goals. So, 
So, we are basically missing the fight when we are not even able to see when that phishing email passed all our layers and then ended up in the user's inbox. And someone actually clicked on that uh, link or opened that malicious attachment. I mean, this is the this is where the fight is. This is the, the what do you call it? The, the trenches. <laughs> it's not only up there in the architecture and uh, security requirements and documents, risk management stuff. I mean, just think about it. The difference it would make to be able to say that you were hacked in the last hour compared to think, say that, oh, I think we were hacked three months ago, but I don't know what happened or how, it, uh, how did it. And it's also pretty scary when you think about it that we don't, we don't have any control over what is running on our systems, what code is running on our systems. We don't have any control over outbound connections. This should scare any IT security manager. So where does all this leave us, actually? This means that we have actually a gap between the security level that we want and desire compared to the actual security level we have. There's a disconnect between the strategy, security strategy, and reality. We're basically not basing our security efforts based on what's happening in the real world. I mean, as an example, take the security requirement that almost everyone, of course, has, that our systems should be able to uh, should be protect, protect against malicious code. I have seen very few organizations that are able to comply with their own requirement and lock down their clients enough. So why is this gap there? Is it that management uh, doesn't understand or is it that we security specialists are bad at explaining this gap? Or is it that we are more comfortable buying security products uh, having information security consultants uh, or hiring pen tests or producing compliance reports from IT auditors? Or is it that our colleagues in the security industry simply doesn't have enough experience from real world attacks and how attackers think? It can also be that we trust our outsourcing partners way too much. When they promise in the contract that they will monitor our network, they have a CM where they will collect logs and they promise to report when they detect incidents. But way too often I've seen that they rarely uh, escalate incidents to the customer. <coughs> yeah, and outsourcing of, for example, firewall management where you have some managing your firewall and you add new rules, you need to open us up this port to this IP address, etc. And then you assume that the guys managing the firewall actually keep the entire rule set up to date, removing old stale rules and stuff like that. But if that's not what you bought, that's not what you're going to get. Uh, so we see that quite a lot too, where you have thousands of rules more or less permitting everything and it was set there years ago. Uh, so that's also, uh, I mean, you need to know what you're buying. Precisely. So how do we fix this? First of all, we need to have, we have to change our strategy and security goals. We have to come to the insight that prevention is futile without detection and response. It has to go hand in hand. And of course, vice versa. Detection and response cannot live without uh, good preventive work where we harden our networks and systems. We have been saying for many years as security specialists that uh, the management has to get on board, of course, but we still have to keep nagging uh, because they have to understand that they have an important role to play in uh, minimizing this gap between actual security and uh, required security. And I think it should be totally natural for any organization to have a simple goal that no unauthorized activity should be happening in our environments, IT environments, without us detecting it. 
It's a, sounds pretty ambitious, but it's pretty simple. <laughs> and of course, speed matters when an intrusion happens. Time to detection is critical. It is the speed with, with how an organization uh, detects and responds to an uh, intrusion that will limit the damage and the consequences. It will also lower the cost of recovery if you detect an attack on the client side instead of months later see that they have had access to our domain. Another part of the solution is to shift resources from, the, from insufficient preventive work. And this, of course, will look different in different organizations. You have to go back home and think, where, where are, we getting bang for, <laughs> are we getting enough security for the money uh, with all the preventive work that we do? We have, I've seen organizations that have big teams with uh, information security consultants. And don't get me wrong, I'm an information security consultant myself from the beginning. Uh, they have an important work, job to do, but maybe we are we are having too much overhead uh, there. We can do more efficient work. We can maybe train the developers to code more securely. We can let the project uh, managers uh, handle IT security requirements, give them proper checklists, stuff like that. Um, and being been, been in a government agency, I've seen how we had an accreditation process, for example, for systems, and that was pretty heavy. It was not very agile at all. So when the police needed a new app, it could take way too long just because there was another security department way uh, too, too far away from IT and who didn't understand technology, and they had requirements that were not realistic or they didn't understand how we uh, mitigate the risks that they, see, uh, that they see. Yeah, so I would really strongly recommend everyone to start planning to build a SOC and a C cert. You either do it yourself or you take help from the outside, and uh, the outside help can look different in uh, different ways. You can either you can ship. If you have a, a good security partner that you trust, you can ship the logs to that partner or give access to the logs, and they can be your SOC. There are a lot of uh, companies offering these services. Uh, or you can have a hybrid of these, uh, th these two. Uh, you can have, for example, internal staff looking at uh, basic indicators of compromise while you have an outside partner helping you with threat hunting, which is more advanced, which needs more security experience. But I, I would also really recommend everyone to uh, create an operational team that ha handles everyday ad hoc security problems. It doesn't have to be incidents, but a uh, security alert or security event can uh, teach you a lot about misconfigurations in your environment and uh, you get no more insight into how you should tweak certain security settings or uh, rebuild your architecture, or stuff like that. Uh, the, the, there are a lot of benefits with having a staff of people who work with security problems, ad hoc security problems, day to day, to day in day to day operations. Hmm? Sure. So where do we start? Yeah, the recommendation is to. Start small. If, you, if it's difficult for you to allocate a budget immediately, uh, start small. You can just use the IT security guys and girls who are interested in IT security in your organization and who are operating your security functions and security products. Maybe they can, you can have a rotating schedule that once a, week, once a week someone is, no, I'm sorry, every week someone is having eyes on what those uh, products are reporting. And tweaking, and or you can staff it, uh, whatever, however, however it suits you. But start small, and you can start by obviously uh, creating uh, detection on obvious indicators. Like, like I said in the beginning, if there's a new uh, phishing campaign, you would want to detect if that email goes through all your filters. And 
I really want to uh, explain use cases. That's a great methodology uh, to, uh, to base... The question is what, what you want to detect, right? And if you define a use case for the SOC operator, you can base it on uh, what threats that you, your organization is scared of. And then you can uh, uh, basically, uh, based on a certain attack scenario, you can go and figure out what indicators would the attacker leave behind. And then you uh, see what log sources do I have uh, or what log data do I need to collect uh, in order to see this. This is a great way of uh, making sure that you don't collect all log data. You only collect the data that brings value to your detection capability. That's also a common mistake that um, people collect way too much data that is unnecessary. <clears throat> Can I just yeah, say first. something? Because yeah. yeah. I think use cases are great. Uh, a great way for, let's say, if I'm the IT security manager, if I can sort of put all my, all the stuff that we're doing are more or less concentrated in, say, 10 use cases, then I can describe those use cases to management saying that here are 10 use cases, uh, and one is uh, like malicious code executing in our environment. Uh, we're up to 50% on fulfilling this goal, but we're not really there, and then we have this and that. Then you get you get something to talk about, because talking to management about some rogue process doing this, yeah, avoiding VMs and whatever it does, that doesn't work. Uh, no. I've tried for 20 years and it doesn't work, but with the use case, you can bring people together, we can talk about something that everyone can understand. Management realizes, okay, this is gonna cost money, yeah, but we're gonna fix it in the cheapest possible way. So that's, I mean, you've been working on it and I've been working on it to try to connect these the techie guys yeah. who just work with the computers and the management with people and money. And get, getting that together is it's not hard, it's super hard. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but and I think use cases is one way of sort of trying to solve the problem. Right. To show you what Magnus was saying is just a simple uh, use case example here. Uh, yeah, this, this phishing attempt that happens uh, that bypasses our defenses. That threat description is very easily understandable for the management. They, they understand that we need to be able to uh, see this. So uh, the IT security requ SOC requirement can be something like that they, the SOC should be able to detect if a user opens a malicious attachment. And then, in the then you become more technical. You, the, the, you start to define exactly how that would look like technically. And that's how you build a, uh, a great alert. <laughs> For example, that um, the Windows scripting engine starts something, or that you have outbound connection from PowerShell, which is pretty common. And then you define, how would I see this? Where do I need, which data do I need to collect to see this? In this example, Windows event log, is, we'll see this. This, uh, this is like the glue between the, the IT security yeah. policy and what the SOC actually does. Exactly. You have a policy saying we need to protect our email servers and uh, the yeah. no malware should come through. Okay, what does that mean in reality? Okay, we have a use case for it. So we sort of connect, connect the dots all the way. Yeah. Uh, because you can't be too explicit in one of these either because then the upper level won't get it because this is not their expertise. Exactly. And once you have a critical base of use cases to give you just the basic detection capability against uh, basic threats, uh, uh, it's, you will have a matrix of use cases and you, you should have a, uh, in that matrix, you will also see what log sources will provide you with the data. It's a good overview. And, and you will also, sorry. Yeah, that's uh, a great picture. I mean, yeah. just, just the firewall logs. If you have outsourced uh, the management of your firewall, yeah. and then you have an incident, and then you call your uh, outsourcing partner saying, yeah. I need the firewall logs right now. Oh, sorry, you can't have it. It's a shared environment. Oh, but you can have it in two months. Okay, great. So 
if you have this in place, then you can start doing your research. Can we get access to these logs, which we need to do the work? Exactly. No. So how, how do we get that? So this, uh, this doesn't solve the problem, yeah. it just helps you to start with solving it. Exactly. Another benefit is also here you can see if your security architecture is good enough. Do you have that layered defense and depth that you want? Do you have the logs at all? <laughs> yeah. Um, some success factors that I, I'm going to tell you based on my experience. Um, first of all, it all starts with the, you need the backup from the leadership, the management. Because you are going to compete with other resources, of course. That's our reality. Uh, you need to have a, a clear goal, a commitment from the leadership that this, we really need to do this. You, ha you also need to have access to security specialists. You either have your own or you take help. And this can be um, either in the building phase, designing phase or in the building phase, or as I mentioned earlier, um, while it's operational in case you buy this service from outside. And, yeah, I can't emphasize enough, don't collect all log data. Use the use case methodology to find out which log data will give you value. And, like I said before, start small. Use the security products consoles that you have. Learn them, see if they are configured correctly. Um, Make sure you have visibility in what's happening in, on your clients. Uh, make sure you have visibility on what traffic is going out. And another uh, success factor is that at the police, we were very careful with uh, being transparent. Be, don't be that sec secret uh, security team doesn't, that, that doesn't tell the Windows guys or the the network guys, anything about what's, what incidents are going on. We, we built a totally different culture when we started to explain to them what, what's, what we are scared of is going to happen and what happens. And um, it, it helps to build this culture where everyone realizes that we are in the same boat. And even if we have other work tasks every day, we, will, we, we need to do This is a uh, combined effort. It ended up with everyone becoming interested in IT security. And of course, work closely with the business. Understand what the business are planning. Are they planning to deploy systems on the DMZ that will start talking, connecting in, inwards? Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, integrate with IT operations. The other tech groups, very important. So now, Magnus, you show some actual detection. Yeah, sure. Uh, yesterday we saw Fabio and, and the guys uh, doing some attacks. And today we will show you that uh, their attempts were futile. We were onto them from the first step all the way in. Uh, not really, but sort of close. Uh, so we go through the, the, the web app attack uh, where we actually sucked at uh, detecting. And then we increase and then we sort of kind of find them uh, and uh, we show you guys what they did. Uh, and finally, a, a short uh, analysis of a domain fronting attack, which is quite hard to actually find in, in real life, but we'll do some. Yeah. Yeah, no, sir. So, uh, just to show you guys that uh, this does not have to be expensive and take a long time, uh, we or actually the attackers built it for us this time. Uh, we, we have built a small, uh, call it the SOC SIM stack, using Sysmon and WinLogBeat uh, on the Windows systems, uh, which is all open source. It basically collects event data from, from uh, the client or server, what's happening on the system, and then sending it over to the Elasticsearch uh, database. And then we use Kibana as a search interface into that. Uh, and this is all, well, the first fix is always free, uh, but you can actually build quite a lot with this. Uh, so you get the entire infrastructure of a, a basic SIM system, then you have to fill it with your own artificial intelligence and whatnot. 
uh, to make it work. So the next picture. So the web app attack. Uh, I'm going to jump into my machine then. Uh, we actually uh, we, we were not so prepared. We have the access logs and the error logs from the web server. Uh, but the web server is uh, communicating over, over HTTPS, so our network recording was of limited use because we couldn't analyze the traffic. Uh, so this is just yeah, like an example of start small. Okay, we have something, but we, we don't have enough. So just switch over here to my machine. Uh, so I'm impersonating a first-time SOC analyst. And this is the access log to the system. Uh, I don't have any tools. I haven't indexed anything. Just a lot of GET requests. And well, you get it. Oh, there's some posts here. File manager, AJAX calls. Oh God, what are we going to do with this? But something strange has been happening to our to our system. So we step into the error log. Okay, uh, start looking around here. And of course, I mean, in reality, if this would have been a big system, there would be thousands of log files and megs of data to, to analyze. So you need to be clever about it. Uh, but in the end, since I know a few things about this, I see this here, undefined index command. Yeah, in the shell.php on line three. Sounds strange. And I also have ls invalid option. ls cannot access no such file. Undefined index. Okay. This is this is not look good. So what do I do? Well, I contact the developers saying, what are these kind of, I mean, errors? Is, is that normal for the application? No, that's not normal for the application. Okay, so something fishy is going on. And someone has also been able to, well, run this code here, which we didn't put that file there. So it must have, have well, someone put it there. The question is who? So uh, what do we do? Well. Uh, someone has obviously accessed our, our system from, from the outside, so maybe we should uh, look for some external connections from the inside and out. Okay, so I have my, I'm just going to show you, sorry, this, so, yeah. So here's the Kibana console, uh, freshly installed, and we have some, pumped all the, the events uh, using WinLogBeat into this. Uh, so there's a lot of data there uh, with network connections, uh, spawn processes and stuff like that. Uh, you can do queries here on the command line, uh, but if you want to automate this, which you will want to do uh, uh, as you move, progress, move along, uh, you write code, Python or whatever, to, to access the system from, from the, uh, the REST APIs or, or similar. So uh, I have, sorry. Uh, connections. So, small script, asking Kibana, do you see any external connections from the inside going out? Okay, that was 2,600 rows. Okay, well, that's, that's quite a lot. Uh, hmm. Let's see. Well, external connections. I know uh, what Suresh talked about and the attackers. Today they are using PowerShell. Okay, let's grab for PowerShell in this. Okay, so there's here. There seems to be a lot of PowerShell processes going on. We can scroll up here. Yeah, that seems strange. And uh, the IP address here, 172.16.10.188. That is not an RC1918 address. You're seeing it wrong. That's an external IP address. Okay, in this system. <laughs> Just think of it as an external IP address. So, okay. Someone is uh, obviously uh, <coughs> communicating to the outside. Um, so, I wrote this little script, or I changed another one, uh, which actually checks for PowerShell connections to these two, uh, the strange IP addresses that we have, uh, have seen. And we see this guy here, Leon Vargo on client 01. There are a few PowerShell processes running there from, from his machine uh, going out. 
So, okay. What to do? Maybe we could could see if he he has uh, downloaded some files. Well, maybe computer name is so one dot Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay, sure. So we have a few hits, and also we add. Uh, sorry, we need another filter, add filter. I'm just going to explain this to you in a short while. Event ID is 15. So there we go. So, so this. Uh, da, 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 da. Here you go. Just a second. Uh, no, not that one. Uh, Popular, no, available fields. Uh, da, 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 da. Target file name, add. Okay, so. So the thing is here that uh, we're filtering for the client machine and also for event ID 15, which is an ID from Sysmon saying uh, that the file stream was created or a file has been saved uh, to the hard drive. Uh, and what we see here is that. On the system, we have some, uh, some uh, Office 365, and then up here, a, a download of a picture.zip. So, okay, it's not much going on, but there are a couple of downloads. We have the fish and, and the picture. So, okay. Let's give this here. Maybe we should do this one here. Process tray dot. I'm going to check out one of these processes which has been running on Leon's machine. Okay. So that was another script uh, extracting the data from, from, from Kibana, showing all the processes that led up to the execution of that PowerShell command. And uh, as you see here, you have the explorer process, which in turn has executed wscript.exe on this downloaded file here, picture.zip. Yeah, we remember that one, executing picture.js. This actually means that uh, Leon has double-clicked on this file, which was downloaded, oh, which he got in the, in, in the phishing attack uh, previously. Okay. So, but these guys are smart. There's some sort of encrypted command going on here. Okay, yeah, you've seen that before. Yeah, but we're smarter than these guys because I know base 64. Huh. Sorry. <laughs> I've seen this before. Uh. Okay, you guys see that? Okay, so. So it actually was base 64, huh? No, you guys. Uh, so what happened? Well, Leon has downloaded and executed logo.png. Uh, and that's probably not an image file since this thing creates new processes on Leon's system. So that's a bad PNG file. But at least we're, we're making some progress here. Uh, we see that some sort of, I mean, we can of course go and talk to Leon, uh, but we see that some sort of uh, phishing attempt has obviously succeeded. He has double-clicked on a file, which everyone does once in a while. Uh, and here we see the connection, the outgoing to this 10.188. Uh, so I think we're, we're sort of sh shaping up here in the, the, the SOC team. And then the point here is to show that the data is there. Uh, the, the visualization to the SOC operator will, of course, that needs another layer of logic. The point here exactly. is to show that, it, that they leave the tracks behind. Yeah. So let's continue the investigation because here's the process that gets run. So we get back in Kibana. I'll just, no, oh, sorry. Um, I'll remove this one. I just need to 
make sure I do it right. Okay, so, and this is actually really cool because what we do here is that we ask the system, uh, here's uh, the client, and we want to get event data parent process GUID. Uh, the parent process, has it spawned anything? Well, yeah, obviously. Those are quite disturbing recon commands being executed. Right? And we saw these guys doing this. Here's the net use of SQL 01. And like you guys said, boom. If you see this, you need to go talk to someone, OK? You're, you're done. This is bad. Uh, we don't know exactly how they got hold of this my very secret password. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's besides the point right now. We see, we see something. We need to act on it. Uh, and it's also the case because not every process is spawned by, by this. Uh, 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 first, first one. So, cool. Can we do anything more with that? Uh, yep. Just let me see what I should do <coughs> from my cheat sheet. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, sure. I'm just gonna. You reiterate the fact that uh, you can do a lot with this free stuff. I was actually amazed at uh, the amount of information you could get from, from Sysmon and uh, this uh, WinLog bit from, from the Elastic Search uh, guys. Uh, because previously there was no easy way of getting Windows event logs into this. But with this WinLog bit, you can set up a sort of entire monitoring system in, in just days. Am I right? So let's check if that process do, does something else. Uh, so, oh, that was not it. That was the secret command. I know this, this is tedious work, but that's how it is. And maybe some I don't know if I can see that one. Parent process. Uh, which ones do I have? I have the command line, no, I don't need that one. Destination host name. Nope. Sorry? Yeah, exactly. I thought I had it here before. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, there we go. Exactly. Yeah. So what I'm doing here is I'm checking this. Uh, uh, the process for other external connections. I mean, we know about 10, 10 189 uh, connections going out there. There's a lot of them. So maybe we should just uh, remove that and say event data dot data destination IP is not 172.16.10.189. Save. Okay. Since I know that 40 is our SQL server, I can conclude that this anomalous process, which we don't want executing in, inside our uh, environment, is actually communicating to the SQL server. We also saw that net use command. So there's definitely some, some fishy stuff going on here. Okay. Uh, how much time do I have left? 
So, here's another really interesting thing to do. Sorry. Let's just remove these. Okay. Not yeah, it's in my VM, so it sometimes it takes a while. Parent image. Oh, God, I missed. <laughs> so, they were, and here's another really cool thing. This is the uh, remote uh, WMI thingy in, in Windows, uh, which is spawning this instrumentation uh, processes to, to uh, like we said previously, used it to take care of your IT environment, but the bad guys used it for moving laterally in, inside the environment. Uh, and maybe we should, oh, well, I'm just gonna show you here. I need to add the computer name. Uh, remove that. What's that? That's the target file name, remove that. Okay. So, we have quite a few PowerShell processes executing on SQL 1 at around the time of the attack. We also see uh, the guys on their reg save mischiefs, saving it into the loot directory. So you're not entirely invisible, which is a good thing for us. with this. Do that. And here's the fun part. Since I can also get uh, the process GUI from these processes executing on SQL 1, I can actually go into Kibana and uh, see what that process actually does. Okay, so just let me copy this here. That was the wrong machine, right? Uh, I saw that. Mm. I got it. Okay. So, there we go. Okay. They're executing some, something uh, using this the SQL sync, as we see. Uh, it's a PowerShell. And it's a lot of stuff going on. But that looks like base64 again. You're not encrypting your shit. Okay. <laughs> we'll just decrypt it, right? Yeah, yeah. Obfuscation is a better word, absolutely. Uh, okay, and here we see this, well, the really disturbing part of this attack. So, again, from this 188, which is an external IP address, probably the, the malware server or something, they take something called extract LSAS creds, and execute it. And then they write it to a file, and then they upload that file, and then they remove that file. If it didn't run a couple of hours ago, now is also the time to start running, because this is <laughs> really bad, because this is, uh, is executing on, on the SQL server, where we probably have a lot of sensitive stuff. So, are you guys getting sad already, or? <laughs> Mm. Yeah, exactly. We have the APT session after our session where you get to cream us and we don't get to defend ourselves. But yeah. we'll be back <laughs> next year. Betcha. <laughs> okay, let me see. Uh, okay. Oh. I'll just put this one up here. We can, of course, also do this. We see here that there's... 
these two processes seem to be the same, uh, but due to a slightly misfortunate configuration error, uh, the entire PowerShell command is not stored in that field. So we'll have to do this again to extract what is actually being done. Uh, and again, this the obfuscation of the, their lame attempt to hide. Uh, okay, so we see the same thing again. They have done some recon first to do the LSS extraction, and then here's this logo.png again. Yeah, okay, so they're setting up some sort of remote shells using uh, the exact same methodology that they did on, on client 01. So we're, we're more or less on them using nothing but these quite simple tools. Yeah. Poor man's sock. A poor man's sock. <laughs> uh, okay. Do you have anything to add? Because I think this is more or less, yeah, well, well, what I have time to show you right now. Uh, we saw a lot of your, your guys' attacks. We should have been better on the uh, initial uh, web attack and the phishing, but we're learning. So yeah. next year we'll see that too. Okay. So, so everything that Magnus did manually here can be automatic, uh, automatically, uh, you can build alerts that will automatically tell the SOC operator if this chain of events happens. I mean, I think most of you understand that, but... Yeah, exactly. Uh, the idea is then to build upon this. We have done something small and we have showed hopefully a few people that we can actually detect this doing quite simple stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then, like Suresh says, we we'll write a few scripts, we'll automate it, doing Chrome jobs or whatever, to have this automated. Uh, of course, now we, look, we, now we know what to look for, so we need to find patterns in this. Uh, yeah. And it's a great way of building, the, when you're in the building phase of these use cases, just doing this, having access to pen testers who simulate attacks or just execute a uh, test malware in, your, in a controlled way and see what uh, fingerprints, so to speak, are left behind. That way you will have, have great alerts for the SOC. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and I also promised to show you guys something about domain fronting. Uh, and the problem with domain fronting is that you have a lot of uh, cloud services like AWS, Azure, uh, AppSpot, uh, Google's App Engine. Uh, and if anyone deploys an application uh, in those cloud services using nothing but regular HTTP communica communication, if your organization uses other services uh, in, in uh, in that environment, it's quite hard to, to filter out bad communications from good communications. I mean, you could always set up firewall filtering and, and web proxies and, and whatnot, but I mean, is it really viable? How many have the time to do it and keep it updated? Uh, so what the bad guys do is that they deploy these uh, uh, applications uh, on a, on a no, known domain and then do the communication uh, to that. So. I have learned from, from my colleagues uh, that there's some strange HTTP communication going on. Uh, and we have PCAP in place, uh, network recording. So I get a network recording of, of uh, well, during this time, something pretty strange happened. Uh, could you please do an analysis of it? Okay. So I fire up Wireshark. Uh, and they were talking about HTTP, right? So there we go. Okay, so there's well, basically TCP and uh, HTTP over here. So look into that. Okay. Uh, yeah, there seems to be a lot of HTTP traffic, but they also told me that we're going to this uh, place. Sorry. Yeah. Here, the app spot. Just gonna add this. Like so. Every time. Okay. Yeah, 
So out of all this traffic, we have some traffic to TS, could be TrueSec, could, maybe not, uh, getting about us.php. Okay, so we need, we, we need to look into that. I mean, there's, uh, let's see what we can find here. Ooh. Okay, we have the first one here. Yeah, it's a regular get, cool. It's another get. We have a session ID. Ah, you recognize this? It's those TrueSec guys again. That looks strange. We have another get. Fine. Another get. Yeah, okay, so that's, that does not look good. We need to look into it. I'll change my filter, hopefully. Like so. Now I get request and response. So just to make this a bit easier, I'll export it. TS. Save. So. Boom. And obviously, I know what I'm looking for right now, but just to give you a hint here. Uh, Here's the get to about us. Looks completely legit. Full request, yeah. And then we get this back from the server. Okay, set cookie, session ID. Yeah, seems legit. I mean, a session ID, why not? That's the thing we pass back and forth to keep the session going after my login. But it gets weird when the next get contains an entirely different session ID, right? That's not normal. I mean, you should just pass the session ID back and forth. Uh, so what's actually inside this thing here? Well, let's do it like this. Okay. Sorry. And this here is, well, sorry. This is a bit tricky because you see this percent three D. Uh, that means it's URL encoded. So I can't just do like that. I'll have to change that to the equal sign. Uh, well, you get it, the same procedure. That does not look like a session ID to me, right? Uh, so. Yeah, okay, well, something is definitely up with this. Uh, and it will come as no surprise that all of these calls here actually contains the first session ID is the command, and the second one is the answer with the data we're trying to exfiltrate from, from the system. Uh, and the problem with this is it is really, really hard to detect because this is all... I mean, it's just common HTTP communication. Everything is going in clear text. We're passing session IDs back and forth. How on earth would you detect this? Well, not like this. No one in their right mind would fire up Wireshark and look through a PCAP for suspicious session IDs. Uh, it's that and then a straight ticket to hospital. Uh, so, but since I got, I got the hint, and I also have a really smart guy working with me who actually made this thing up, uh, we knew what to look for. But this is just to give you, uh, well, an example of how hard, detection is hard. This is really hard. It's, I mean, I don't but, know. But yeah, just like the penetration testers, we're showing you how they work with the rinse and repeat mindset. You can just apply the same mindset when it comes to yeah, traffic analysis. Just, first of all, understand what is normal in your environment then remove that from the, I mean, filter that away, and you have less data to work with after you filter that. And keep uh, repeating that, you will find weird stuff. If you use the rinse and repeat uh, methodology, even as a blue team person. Uh, same thing with system events. 
But I can uh, yeah, not emphasize enough the importance of working with uh, these use cases where you first really think hard what you want to achieve in your detection. I'll just switch over to uh, when it comes to client side attacks and lateral movements. Uh, every, I mean, don't give up everything. Most of the attacks can be detected. I shouldn't say everything. It can be my last fam famous last words, but uh, yeah, resistance is not futile. If you're, if there are any star trekkers here, <laughs> uh, what else? As in conclusion. Yeah. I think that is the conclusion. Yeah. I mean, we got the bad guys out, uh, obviously. Uh, and we can detect a lot of stuff, yeah. uh, and we need to, to practice on, on detection. So, back to the, uh, what we said, start small, do something, learn from your mistakes, and then build from there. We don't need big projects worth millions of kroners, just do yeah. something. Even just handling Good. small incidents will build your knowledge base, uh, so you're better prepared when the big incident happens. It's just hard work, and you have to start working with it. That's as simple as that.